Professor Douglas Oshiroff is a 1996 Nobel laureate in physics from the Department of Physics at Stanford University. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for his discovery of superfluidity in the isotope helium-3. Professor Oshiroff noticed a jump in the heat capacity of the liquid helium-3, indicating the conditions required for helium-3 to change from an ordinary liquid to a superfluid. His discovery sparked intensive research into superfluid helium-3 and other so-called quantum liquids, as this enabled scientists to study the types of quantum mechanical effects in large, visible systems that could previously only be studied at the atomic and subatomic level. Professor Oshirov's work was considered a breakthrough in low-temperature physics, and in the course of his research on helium-3, he developed an early form of magnetic resonance imaging, but only in one special dimension. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Talk Vietnam for an exclusive interview with 1996 Nobel laureate in physics, Professor Douglas Osharoff from Stanford University. It's our honor and privilege to have him here with us. Today, we will learn about the discovery that won him the Nobel Prize, as well as how science changes our lives. Hi, uh, Professor Osharoff. How are you today? Uh, fine. How was your trip to Vietnam? Is this your first time? First time to Vietnam, yeah. Yeah. but we actually went went to Thailand first before coming here. So by the time I got here, no jet lag anymore. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so what was your first impression of Vietnam upon your arrival? Well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I didn't know what to, to, to think about it because mm -hmm. uh, I was just very happy I hadn't gone to Vietnam earlier, a.k.a. during the war, <laughs> the American war. <laughs> So what made you decide to donate your precious time and energy to the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace? Uwe invited me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very bad at saying no, but, I, <laughs> but it seemed to me that it was a, a really valuable and interesting program mm -hmm. and something that I would enjoy. You know, I do a lot of this. Mm -hmm. I, I in particularly enjoy, I've, I've actually brought demonstration lectures to to first grade classes. Uh, wow. Yeah, so I, mostly, uh, you know, if, if I'm doing demo stuff, it's in the United States because it's kind of hard to get all that stuff overseas. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, I, I think, you know, science is fun and I, I like to share that with other people. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Upon his arrival to Hanoi this time, Professor Osharov joined a press briefing at the Hanoi Hilton Opera. Let's have a look. Hanoi is the second destination after Bangkok for Professor Oshirov on his tour for the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues to Where a Culture of Peace, organized by the International Peace Foundation and the Vietnamese Ministry of Education and Training. The event drew great attention from the Vietnamese mass media. I really think that, that what this, this exercise for me is all about is is, is sharing uh, my excitement uh, toward science and try to explain to you how science indeed uh, is uh, discovered new science uh, and, and how uh, we can use that science to improve the lives of all of us. To be able to invite them to Vietnam, the organizers had to contact the guest scientists two years in advance. Visits like these benefit Vietnam in many ways, according to the planners. These are not one-time visits only, but the visits with many fruitful returns. We want them to become somehow ambassadors of Vietnam, goodwill ambassadors, and also tell about their good experience here uh, when they go back to the United States or to Europe, what they have learned here from Vietnam. We want them also not only to speak, not only to talk, but also to listen, to learn more about Vietnam, uh, and to see how they can be of um, benefit uh, for the development of the country in the long run. Members of the audience asked Professor Oshirov many questions at the event. The answers is provided satisfied Vietnamese journalists, including Le Thanh Y. I think it, it really uh, will behoove. Giáo sư đã đề ra một vấn đề như thế này. Chúng ta phải tăng cường đưa các bạn trẻ đi học mà theo các hợp đồng, mà thậm chí này các bạn trẻ đủ trình độ và điều kiện giúp được các giáo sư thì người ta sẽ rằng trao thêm tiền trả công cho họ trong những cái việc họ hợp tác làm ăn. Cho nên tôi cho rằng đây là một cái hướng mới mà có lẽ 
mình cũng nên chấp thời cơ. Right after the press conference, Professor Oshawa restarted his hectic schedule of meetings with Vietnamese policymakers, lecturers, and Vietnamese physicists and students. You were um, always interested in science from a young age, and, and your parents had a great influence, and they facilitated that interest of yours. Can you tell me a little bit about their influence on you when you were a young child? Well, you know, I guess I was, I think, six years old when I got an electric train for Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was a typical toy, but by the end of Christmas Day, I'd taken the locomotive apart to get the electric <laughs> motor out. Excellent. And this was a, mm -hmm. a watershed moment. I think if my parents said, you destructive devil, go to bed without your supper, <laughs> we wouldn't be having mm -hmm. this conversation mm -hmm. now. But, but okay. my parents, particularly my father, was fascinated with my fascination for, mm -hmm. for mainly electricity and magnetism. Mm -hmm. In an interview, you once said that you may have, uh, well have been a danger to your family as a child, since you had an interest in gunpowder and high voltage electricity. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yeah, the, the gunpowder, I don't think that was too much of a danger, but I, I did, I like to blow things up, it's, <laughs> it's true. Uh, high voltage electricity, I think, I, I probably, that was, there was one time I, I charged a bank of capacitors, which I'd gotten my, my father had a, 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 a patient, he was a medical doctor, my father was, and, and he had a patient that worked for the telephone company, and, and he would bring stuff to my father to give to me and, uh, and I could generally find ways of making that stuff nearly lethal. So I, I had a bunch <laughs> of capacitors and I charged them all up to 600 volts and then, you know, mistakenly I discharged the, the capacitors uh, across my body and the next thing oh I no. knew I, I woke up on the other side of the room <gasps> and I had no recollection of, of being shocked by this thing. It just, you know, it was, one of these things so wow uh, yeah yeah I you know I would probably was kind of dangerous mm -hmm. you're mm. a no Nobel laureate today no. but um, back in the day in school were you the best in your class well you know I, you know when I was actually a slow reader in mm -hmm. fact I still am uh, so I think in first grade I probably didn't look very smart but you probably by sixth grade I, mm -hmm. I looked pretty smart and I think after that, I was usually number one in my class, but, you know. Excellent. So, where were you when you received the news that you had won the Nobel Prize back in 1996? Well, I, so, I was in bed asleep. <laughs> the, the call came at 2.30 in the morning. Oh, wow. And, and so, the phone rang. Now, the phone is on my wife's side of the bed, mm -hmm. but she never picks it up. <laughs> so, I j jumped out of bed, ran around, picked up the phone. I said, hello? And the person on the other, si other end said, hello, hello, is this Douglas Oshara? I said, yes, it's 2.30 in the morning. And he said, I know that, but I have a matter of some importance, if you will. I am Carl Uffjark, Sipson, Secretary General of the Royal Swedish uh -huh. Academy of Sciences. And in that moment, of course, my jaw drops down uh -huh. to my navel because I know exactly what this phone mm -hmm. call is about. And so he taught, you know, he tells me that I'm getting the Nobel <laughs> Prize and who I'm sharing the prize with, and which was good. Imp mm -hmm. That was kind of important because, uh, you know, there were two professors that that basically trained me, mm -hmm. and and provided the research uh, capabilities and everything. Anyway, that. So what did you do right after you got that phone call? Well, I felt that my life was changing, and it was one of these moments that really a watershed moment in my life, and, and you know, I think I understood pretty well that it was, th things were going to be different after that. You know. In the 1930s, another strange phenomenon was observed. This rapidly evaporating liquid helium cools until at two degrees above absolute zero, a dramatic transformation takes place. Suddenly, you see that the bubbling stops and that the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particularly is happening. Well, this, this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. 
Ordinarily, this container with tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film can climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. New radical theories were needed to explain them. So what actually triggered your co-discovery of superfluidity in helium-3? I thought we were going to be studying solid helium-3. And in fact, there were, there were two people in, mm -hmm. in the research group, two graduate students that were doing rather similar experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the technique that we used to, to get cold involved the solidification of liquid helium-3. So we had a mixture of mm -hmm. liquid and solid helium-3 in the, in the cell. And, and I was uh, looking, I, I was basically converting liquid to solid at a constant rate, and, and, and the pressure was rising as it should if things were getting cold. And then all of a sudden there was a very sharp decrease in the rate of cooling. And I, of course, thought that was terrible. Mm -hmm. That was the signature of, of superfluidity in helium-3, actually. Do you think that luck may have had a role, though tiny, in all those landmark discoveries made by you and other Nobel laureates? Well, you know, what I say is, is, is that bright people manufacture their own luck, you know, by, by being at the right place at mm -hmm. the right time, doing something different that no one's done before, and, and developing technologies that allow you to probe nature in a new and different realm. Mm -hmm. Looking back at your career path so mm. far, do you think it was a tough one? And what was the greatest challenge that you have faced? I don't think it was tough. It, 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 kind of was, it was something I, you know, always enjoyed doing. I guess, you know, the, the four years at Caltech were the mm -hmm. hardest. Okay, I mean, the Caltech was really tough. And, uh, you know, I took, took physics from, from Richard Feynman, who was mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, uh, my, my freshman class started out 192 uh, students and, and the, the, the beginning of the second year only 120 returned. So that gives you some <laughs> idea of what it's about. But, but you know, for me it was, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but it was a lot of work. I mean, you know, I think you're, look, I think people that, that don't challenge themselves don't mm -hmm. go anywhere, yeah, right? That's true, yeah. very true. Um, so after graduating from Caltech, mm. you went on to um, Cornell University yeah. in 1967. Yeah. Um, during that time, you and your colleagues, David Lee and Robert Richardson, uh, made the discovery that later brought you the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about those years? Well, uh, so I, I came to Cornell and, and the first semester, you know, I was a new graduate student. Mm -hmm. I wasn't attached to a research group yet although I was teaching for Dave Lee, mm -hmm. so he knew who I was. And uh, eventually uh, I got into the, the low temperature group mm -hmm. and, uh, and because, you know, there were two talks actually that, that first semester when I was there on low temperature physics. And it looked to me like this would allow me to look at nature in a new and different realm. And, and that's why I, I went into low temperature physics. And, mm -hmm. And so I, I started, and it was a wonder, it was a magical time because there were these new refrigeration technologies that were just being developed and, and I was kind of Excited. part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so at first it was a matter of getting cold and, <laughs> and, and, and maintaining very low temperatures. I and mean, we could get down to a fraction of a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. And then I was doing this experiment, which was really mostly testing out the technology. Mm -hmm. And I, I, everything was cooling very nicely. And then all of a sudden there was a, sh a rather sharp decrease mm -hmm. in the rate of cooling. And of course, oh, I was very unhappy to mm -hmm. see that. But that was the signature of mm -hmm. superfluidity yeah. in helium-3. Uh.
So you shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Lee and Richardson, yeah. um, who were both senior um, researchers at that time, while you were a graduate student. Yeah. Um, does that that probably doesn't happen very often? Does it? I don't know. I, <laughs> I mean, it, it it I think for me it seemed quite natural, mm -hmm. and uh, I you know it's funny that you, the Nobel Prize was split three ways and so I got only a third but <laughs> you know, the Nobel Prize is not about money it, no. it, it's fame and glory <laughs> I suppose. How do you think you could emerge so rapidly and so successfully? What led to that? Well you know I must say that that after discovering superfluidium 3 of course I immediately focused in on that and did mm -hmm. what I th you know the, what when you discover a, a new phenomenon or new field mm -hmm. you know the thing you want to do is skim all the, the what they call it skimming the cream off the top <laughs> you, you do all the good experiments first so I tried to do as many of those as I could and, and it was amazing because well of course very shortly after the discovery I moved to AT&T Bell Laboratories mm -hmm. now the, the, the bad part about that was that I had to start all over again, building up a new laboratory. Yeah. Uh, but, but Bell Laboratories was very generous to me, very supportive of my research. And so I, was, I had a technician, but in fact, the technician only took one set of data for me in, in the many years that I was at Bell Labs. I never understood that data. <laughs> So, so I would basically form my technician out to other people, yeah. and I thought that was a good use of his time, and, mm -hmm. and I was happier working by myself. Yeah. So. so how has your Nobel Prize winning discovery been applied so far? Well, he, superfluid helium-3 was, uh, the, well, I guess, to use a technical term, the first mm -hmm. unconventional BCS state. Now, BCS is, stands for Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer. They were mm -hmm. the three people that, that, that explained the microscopic origins of superconductivity in metals, obviously. And, and superfluid in helium-3 was, in fact, a broad generalization mm -hmm. of that theory, but, but you know, uh, where there was very different, because in the case of a superconductor, uh, the, the attractive interaction that leads to the formation of Cooper pairs, they're the entities that really condense, uh, was through the lattice. Superfluid helium-3 has no lattice. It's, it's all a liquid. Mm -hmm. And so it was really very different s system. And it was, man, I had really world-class theorists that were popping their heads mm -hmm. in my lab every day asking me what was the news and stuff like mm -hmm. that. During his visit to Vietnam this time, Professor Ashraf visited the Hanoi National University where he lectured on how science changes our lives. Let's take a look. The conference hall of the National University of Vietnam today is full since every student wants to see with their own eyes a Nobel laureate. A ceremony was held today to commemorate the honorary doctorate that the president of the university presented to Professor Osharov, the second time such an honor has been given to a Nobel laureate. Thông qua cái việc vinh danh những nhà khoa học xuất sắc có công hiến lớn lao cho nhân loại như giáo sư Osharov và các nhà tưởng Nobel khác, thì cả những nhà khoa học xuất sắc thế giới và chúng ta hiểu biết lẫn nhau hơn và như vậy thì cái cầu nối cái hợp tác giữa Đại học Hà Nội với Đại học Stanford nơi giáo sư Osharov làm việc cũng như với các trường đại học Hoa Kỳ khác và các tổ chức khác nói chung sẽ được phát triển. Nguyễn Đức Hoài is among the lucky few who met and talked with Professor Osharov during his previous seminars abroad. Meeting him again in Vietnam reminds Hoài of earlier events. Trước đây khi mà trước khi gặp giáo sư thì tôi nghĩ rằng ông Osharov là một ông rất là nghiêm khắc và rất là kỹ tính bởi vì chúng tôi đã gặp rất nhiều nhà khoa học và họ có những cái nguyên tắc nhưng mà đối với ông Osharov thì cái cảm nghĩ ban đầu về một cái nhà khoa học mà rất là thân thiện và gần gũi và ông ấy có thể chia sẻ cùng uống một cốc nước trà và chia sẻ tất cả các câu chuyện cho chúng ta. On these rare occasions, meeting with a Nobel laureate. Students asked the professor many questions. The questions could be about the scientist himself, his research method, or which area they should focus on in the future. Biggest wishes. I don't know what to tell you, but, but uh, in fact, it, 
it's, uh, I think you have to, at some level, if you're doing basic science, uh, part, of, part of the joy of doing basic science is answering questions that, that no one knows the answers to. And, and, and there's a lot of joy in, involved in that. But, but in fact, I think if, if you want to maybe better mankind's position on, uh, you know, you can come up with new technologies and things, that's not basic science anymore. That's, that, that's really uh, applied science. And, and, and I would dare say that I think there's a lot of applied science that is very in useful, very enjoyable to do, uh, and in fact, I think you you don't have to worry whether something you're doing, such as maybe superfluidity healing three, actually will ever be useful for mankind. So, so it's 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 a I think it's a decision that you have to make. Cũng như lúc nãy em đã đặt câu hỏi cho giáo sư thì hiện tại bọn em ở trường cho phổ thông chuyên khoa tự nhiên cũng đang có một câu lạc bộ khoa học. Em rất mong muốn là nhờ những uh, buổi nói chuyện như giáo sư ngày hôm nay thì các bạn học sinh sẽ có thể được uh, tiếp lửa niềm đam mê và có thể biết đâu sau này thì sẽ có ai đó đạt giải Nobel chẳng hạn. Em thích cái câu là uh, đừng bỏ cuộc khi uh, gặp những uh, điều khó khăn trong cuộc sống uh, thì uh, nó cho em một uh, nỗ lực để uh, tiếp tục uh, uh, cố gắng trong học tập và theo sự nghiệp sau này. Winning a Nobel Prize is the wildest dream for students of science here today. But who knows if someone can attain something great thanks to this talk? That fact will only be known in the future. You had a lecture at the Hanoi National University here in Vietnam. Um, you spoke about how science changes our lives. Yeah. Um, how does it actually happen? How does it change <laughs> our lives? Well, it, I mean, take an example. Um, Marconi invents the, the radio or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, radio waves. And, and is that allowed us to communicate mm -hmm. a lot faster. And, and, and so, you know, people communicate, that's very important yeah. stuff, right? And I think it's kind of, I, of course, the Mar Marconi didn't prevent World War II from <laughs> happening, so there's still a lot of misunderstandings yeah. between people. But, but uh, I mean, that's one example. I think, uh, uh, Fleming discovering penicillin is, mm -hmm. is another example where, you know, that was the first of many uh, drugs which, which could cure disease and, and, and prolong life and mm -hmm. things like that. So, so, you know, there were just a lot of things. Yeah. And, and, and in every case, I would say, you know, you can see an advance in science that leads mm -hmm. to better life for human beings. On the other hand, you, you look, for instance, uh, an example is burning coal mm -hmm. we, we go we have to go back a long time yeah. now but we're talking about a watt for instance uh, in, invented the, the steam mm -hmm. he didn't invent the steam engine he actually used thermodynamics to perfect the mm -hmm. steam engine and then people that allowed people to actually create factories in cities rather than where there was falling water mm -hmm. and that really changed things yeah. so these are just some examples but but you know nowadays i think if anything, the, the rate of change of yeah, our lives is a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have any specific advice for young Vietnamese students who choose, um, who wish to mm -hmm. pursue mm -hmm. um, physics as mm -hmm. their lifelong mm -hmm. career? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, it's, a, it's be prepared for great adventure mm -hmm. because I think it, it is an adventure and, and there's still a lot that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But I think y young people need to, first of all, well, Okay, there are two kinds of physicists. There are, are experimentalists. Mm -hmm. I'm an experimentalist. I work with my hands. And there are theorists. And, you know, I think people have to realize, first of all, what they're good at. And mm -hmm. I've always been good at building things and, and, and measuring things and stuff like that. And uh, whereas, you know, mathematically, all this mm -hmm. complex stuff, I, <laughs> I, I don't have much patience for that. So for me, I knew right away that, that I, I would become an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. That was pretty clear to me. But, but I think it's the, the, the first uh, most important thing is that people have to know what they're made of, what, yeah. what they enjoy, what mm -hmm. they're good at, and then match that to, to, to a career. Mm -hmm.
do you think about the importance of self-reliance in, in scientific research? Well, it's kind of interesting. I think there's, that for science to progress as quickly as it, as it has mm -hmm. is largely because of the, the very, uh, I think, effective communications between scientists. So, so you know, for instance, I, I discovered superfluidium 3, but then I worked with the theorist who mm -hmm. then, you know, al allowed, you know, us to mm -hmm. understand helium-3. And, and so I don't think that, that many really uh, effective physicists work all by themselves. Mm -hmm. They tend to work together. At least that, that's certainly been my experience. So teamwork, you say? Team, teamwork, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, but not necessarily a team of, you know, you need people on the team mm -hmm. that have complementary skills. Yeah. Good. So you're now a professor at Stanford University. Yeah, yeah. Um, what can you tell us about your teaching experience there? Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, you teach a lot of different kinds of classes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one class that I really enjoy teaching is, is an advanced lab class. Mm -hmm. Students, uh, typically in groups of three or four, will choose to do a, uh, a, a single experiment in low temperature mm -hmm. physics. And, and then they have to design and build, with my help, of course, mm -hmm. Uh, the the equipment to do that and so it, it's like a, a good experience for them yeah. for a long time I would teach one term of of our engineering uh, entry-level physics class mm -hmm. this counts as a double teaching load which means that I get out <laughs> of teaching for one term <laughs> uh, but but that you know you had a lot of students then and, and 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 it's kind of fun because some fraction of them will come to my office for yeah. our office hours and, you know it, that <laughs> fraction is not very large and the class would be you know 300 or something like that mm -hmm. and, and maybe I would get uh, 30 or something yeah. that would come to my office, but you get to know these students mm -hmm. and, and later, you know, can you write letters of recommendation f uh, for them for graduate mm -hmm. study or something yeah. like that. It's kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really great yeah. for them. <laughs> I don't know for you. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, I mean, I can, can, can look, I, uh, I'm not their parents, but, mm -hmm. but I, I think of them a little bit as mm -hmm. my offspring. It was kind of interesting, uh, you know, even after I got the Nobel Prize, so every, every three years you have to renew your research grants. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I had a grant with the Department of Energy and one with uh, the National Science mm -hmm. Foundation. And I would ask these guys for, you know, every time, I, every three years, I, I would ask for an increment so yeah. I'd get a little bit more money. Yeah. In the 24 years that I was at Stanford University, yes. well, mm -hmm. I still am, but I'm not. I'm not doing research anymore. Anyway, I never got an extra penny. Mm. So, so after a while, what used to support two graduate students would only support one, and, and then it was a lot harder to do the research and stuff like yes. that. So, you know, I don't know what to say. It, it's tough. It's tough even in the United mm -hmm. States, but, but it's got to be tougher for you guys here yeah. because you've got less money. Mm. As part of his activities in Vietnam this time, Professor Osharov met with the leaders of the Ministry of Science and Technology. Let's have a closer look. As in other countries, young people in Vietnam tend to choose careers with more development opportunities, and thus one reason basic science has become less appealing as a college measure. This topic was a major concern raised at the meeting between Professor Osharov and Deputy Minister of Science and Technology Chu Ngoc Anh. Professor Osharov's visit may have influenced the current class. Trong cái cuộc nói chuyện thì rõ ràng giáo sư Douglas Osharov cũng đã thể hiện cái thiện chí rất là cao của mình. Đặc biệt, xin quý vị các bạn nhớ rằng đây là một cái tên tuổi rất lớn và đối với tôi là ngành vật lý thì những cái phát hiện từ cái cái nội dung mà ngài được giải Nobel cùng các cộng sự này sẽ mang một cái dấu ấn hết sức tích cực cùng với lại thiện chí của ngài và chúng tôi tin tưởng chắc chắn rằng dù đây là cái dấu hiệu khởi đầu những cái như đó là cái bước khởi động hết sức tích cực và giáo sư chắc chắn sẽ là cái cầu nối hết sức là hữu ích à, trong tương lai với cái cộng đồng khoa học công nghệ Việt Nam. With his strategy for scientific development, the Vietnamese government set up the National Foundation for Science and Technology Development in 2008 with an annual budget of nearly 10 million US dollars. 
The foundation aims to fund scientific projects by domestic researchers and narrow the gap between Vietnamese and international science. During the reception held in your honor, um, leaders of the Vietnamese Ministry of Science and Technology suggested that they would be grateful for your support um, in the future. Do you have any plans to return to Vietnam? We'll have to see how that mm -hmm. works out. I, I mean, it, it's very easy. A lot of things can be done at a distance now. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to, to Vietnam, of course, is, is a long ways <laughs> away. Uh, and it's a lot of jet lag. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I never say never. And, and, but, but I think, you know, uh, having a, uh, some sort of relationship uh, over the Internet is so easy yeah. now. So, so we'll see how that, that evolves with time. Mm -hmm. So in a developing country like Vietnam, how do you think we should invest in science, um, including physics? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> you're asking me, I mean, first of all, I don't know how much money you guys have to invest, <laughs> and so it's a little bit hard to say, but, but uh, there, there are two issues. One is training young people, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, obviously I don't, I don't know what, what, you know, the, the basis is right now in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of how many professors you have and, and ha what, what their expertise is mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But, but certainly people, I, I would guess you have a pretty well-trained uh, set of, of, of professors at, at universities. And uh, what you're probably thin on, I would guess, is, is equipment and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And uh, like I said, you know, most of the equipment that I used in the discovery that won a Nobel Prize, I built with my own two hands. Uh -oh. So, but I'm not going to well. say that everyone's <laughs> going to do that. Okay, so that that's a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. But um, another, th certainly, uh, there are a lot, a lot of universities that that that, that uh, have old equipment, mm -hmm. um, and certainly. Uh, it, We've shipped uh, old equipment off, typically yeah. to places in South America, because mm -hmm. that's you know. So I know those. That certainly is a possibility. Yeah. I, I don't know whether the uh, there for American Physical Society does it have any programs for what you do with 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 used equipment. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that mm -hmm. right now. But what do you think are the strategies or approaches that Vietnam should consider for the oh, future? Oh, oh, okay. First of all, I think. Uh, no one's going to be interested in, in doing something if they haven't been exposed to it, is my mm -hmm. guess. And, and so, in uh, as undergraduates, I think it's it's good for students to get involved. In the United States now, uh, uh, certainly the opportunities uh, exist not for every student, but mm -hmm. for a lot of students to to work in a research group. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that there, there are opportunities, mm -hmm. and, and it's kind of really great, I think, for undergraduates to get involved in research because, first of all, you find out what kind of research mm -hmm. you, that you excites your mm -hmm. passion. And the, you have to be careful. When, when I say passion, I'm referring to passion for science. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and you find out what you're good at, mm -hmm. and, and you also learn some skills. And so that's an important thing. Yeah. And uh, obviously not... I mean, I don't know how many, we have vastly more undergraduates at Stanford, I guess, than, than we can have working on research programs. Mm -hmm. but, but not all students choose to do that. So far, uh, how have you helped developing countries like Vietnam mm -hmm. in their scientific research? Well, I, you know, I go, I go to a lot of different places mm -hmm. and, and I try to give them good advice mm -hmm. if I can. Uh, and I try to stimulate young people. Mm -hmm. not, uh, I'm not going to give them lots of money because I don't have it. Okay? <laughs> but, but you know, I think hopefully that that when I you know, leave a country, that people have at least a, a, a you know some some idea of where they're going to get mm -hmm. the equipment to allow them to do the science that they would like to do. Yeah. Um, and many researchers, after years of studying and working abroad do not want to return to, home, uh, to their home for yeah. work. What's your advice in this case? That's a really, that's a tough one because mm -hmm. I, first of all, I think that, that uh, your, your, your researchers will be m better trained if they mm -hmm. can come and work in an existing laboratory. 
you know, if they're doing really good job, they probably have opportunities yeah. of staying in the United States mm -hmm. or whatever, Europe, or, uh, so that they may not want to come back. Some will, though. Uh, they, they love the country that they grew up in. Uh, and, uh, of course, it helped. I mean, they're not going to be too interested in coming back if they think the probability of them doing any more mm -hmm. science is nil. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to, to somehow find the, 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 the money to provide m some research support. Yes. I'm not so much talking about s supporting postdocs or mm -hmm. things like that, but, but building up a laboratory. That's an expensive business. <music>special edition of talk vietnam mm -hmm. some of our audience members who are students sent us a few questions for you oh my would you God, like to okay. hear them uh, okay do i have to answer them <laughs> okay let's see so let's start with uh Nguyen Thanh Phong, 23 years old from the diplomatic academy of vietnam mm -hmm. he asked um is it difficult to study physics and how did you appro approach your studies okay well i just you know because of I guess all the stuff I did when I was very young, it was kind of quite natural for me to, 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 to study physics. And um, of course I was in, in a uh, research lab that had mm -hmm. you know, three professors in it, so I was always getting good advice. Yes. And, there were, and I don't know, probably eight or 10 graduate students. And so we you know, learned from each other yeah. and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I think that's the best way for students to learn uh, from each other mm -hmm. more than from professors. <laughs> so his next yeah. question is, what is your next important project? Oh, God, I have no idea what my <laughs> next important project. My research career is, is over now. And I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, unfortunately, my lab is there, and it still has lots of good equipment, but... I don't have the time because of all the other things I do mm -hmm. now to go in there and pretend like I'm a graduate student <laughs> anymore. Um, so another uh, audience member, Le Phuong Tao, 21 years old, mm -hmm. from Hanoi National University asked, if you had to describe your discovery of the superfluidity of helium-3 in a way that even a primary student who has yet to learn physics at school could understand, what would you say? I would say, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, it, I mean, it is, I think students have to understand something yeah. about, about the BCS theory. But, but basically, what happens is there are two kinds of particles in nature. Mm -hmm. Well, there's more than two, but two varieties. There are uh, particles with, with odd half-integral spin, like mm -hmm. one-half, three-halves. Yeah. And there are those particles that have even spin, zero, one mm -hmm. unit of angular momentum. And, and those particles behave very differently. The, the, we, the, the ones that have odd half integral spin, one half, three halves, those are, we call those Fermi particles, mm -hmm. Fermi Dirac particles. And, and they are antisocial, so they don't like each other. So you can't get, get, get two Fermi particles in the same yeah. quantum state. Whereas the other particles, I don't know, if th this may be going beyond. <laughs> I see A primary people school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the other particles are, are Bose particles, which have an integral uh, multiple of h bar angular mm -hmm. momentum. And, and, and those particles are, are the, the ones that love each other. So helium-4 atoms, which, which have uh, an integral sp mm -hmm. spin, uh, form a superfluid at a temperature of about 2.17 Kelvin. Uh, I'm not sure the number is <laughs> exactly right, but around 2 Kelvin. Uh, whereas helium-3 atoms, which are Fermi particles, they're the, one, the antisocial mm -hmm. ones, don't form a superfluid until you get down to a temperature of order 1 to 2 thousandths yes. of a degree. So they, 
So it's a very complicated, very different sort of a process that leads to that kind of ordering. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that would help our primary students. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Well. But I'm sure all the physics students would understand. Okay. So in Vietnam, youngsters tend to choose jobs as their parents wish, with preference often given to business-related careers. They seem to not realize that science is also a good path with value. What do you think about the tendency for parents to encourage business? Um, if you were asked to give Vietnamese parents some advice, what would it be? I, I think... That, that if you love your children, mm -hmm. uh, you should want them to, to have careers which, which are, are satisfying and rewarding. And, and if they're not interested in going into business, I think you shouldn't force them to do that. It's easy for me to say that. <laughs> you had great um, support from your parents. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, Next question, can you please give some advice to help Vietnamese children develop their scientific inclinations from a young age? There's lots of books on, mm -hmm. on physics theory, that's some starting at a, at a very rather mm -hmm. simple uh, level. And, and so I think you know, students that are willing to read, mm -hmm. uh, f that's, that's a first thing, okay, yeah. to, to provide them with books. And then I think, you know, if they have questions, it's important that mm -hmm. there be someone there that can answer those yeah. questions because they will have questions. <laughs> but but that's so that's one side of it. But the other yeah. side is if you want to go into experimental science, then you need a whole different set of skills. <laughs> and, and I guess I started out, you know, when I was very young, you know, working with my hands and and learning how to do things mm -hmm. and soldering irons and making transistor radios yes, and yes. all of that stuff. And even in the United States now, mm -hmm. people won't do that anymore. Yeah. So students don't actually learn those skills mm -hmm. very, very quickly. As a scientist, what principles guide you and what or who inspires you most? I don't know what you mean by what principles guide me. I, I, I try to be <laughs> honest, okay? <laughs> I, I work hard, but, but yeah. I, I don't work hard in order to work hard. I work hard because I'm fascinated with what I'm doing and, and, and I'm interested in finding out what happens. So I, I do think that, that uh, people that go into science uh, can expect that they have to work hard and, yeah. and they shouldn't look at that as, as, as a a punishment or anything like that, but it's an opportunity. Uh, I, was, I mean, there's nothing like discovering something mm -hmm. at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what or who inspires you most? I don't know if anyone inspires me anymore. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on the other side of that. I'm trying <laughs> to inspire <laughs> lots of young people. So I, I go around the country and, and around the world, mm -hmm. you know, telling stories of discovery and, 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 you know, giving advice to students and things like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you, uh, the number that actually, you know, write back, dear Professor Acharov, thank you for the advice you gave me. I've, I've just discovered something. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen very <laughs> often, but I hope that I'm giving good advice and, mm -hmm. and that, that uh, uh, at some point, someone will say, thank you for, <laughs> for what you did, but it hasn't happened so far. <laughs> so what role does your family play in your scientific success story? Oh, well, well, first thing you have to understand is neither my wife, we don't have children. We never mm -hmm. had children. Uh, I think we were both very passionate about our careers. She's a biochemist, and, and, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, I mean, I had just discovered superfluid and helium-3, and so we, you know, we... I think we have a very close marriage. Uh, we love each other, mm -hmm. and and I think we uh, kind of uh, make time to be together. Mm -hmm. uh, but w but but we never had children. Yeah. And so when 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 students ask me this question, I say, no, no. I think of you as my children, <laughs> <laughs> academic children. Yes, not yeah. Um. So, you're, as you said, intellectual offsprings. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Professor yeah. Oshroff, for an absolutely inspiring conversation. <laughs> um, we wish you all the best in your future endeavors, and hopefully see you soon in Vietnam again. Okay, well, <laughs> I look forward to coming back. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
And that's all for a special edition of Talk Vietnam today with Professor Oshroff, the 1996 Nobel Laureate in Physics. I hope you have enjoyed the show as much as I did. I'm Ola Ding. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.